the graduate program in physics at the Federal University of Paraná. Today, we are happy to have the seminar by uh, Professor Alexia Ufevi, and I would like to do a short presentation of our speaker of the day. So she did her PhD in the group of uh, Sergi Haroshi, where she fabricate, fabricate, oh, sorry, fabricate, fabricated Schrodinger cat states of light. She was hired at the National Center for Scientific Research in France in 2005 to realize quantum optics experiments with semiconducting quantum dots. She then took a theoretical turn. She is an expert in quantum thermodynamics, quantum information, and quantum foundations, and works in close connection with experimentalists and theorists older, uh, worldwide. She is also the co-founder of the Quantum Energy, Energy in in Initiative. And at the moment, she is working at the International Research Lab, Marjo Lab in Singapore. So in today's talk, Professor Alexia will present the seminar entitled Quantum Technologies Need a Quantum Energy in Initiative. Uh, Alexia, so then uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and the, uh, the word is, our, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. So good evening, everyone, because now I'm in Singapore, so I'm a bit ahead of you guys. <laughs> it's already uh, it's already the weekend, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure to to hear a little bit of Brazilian accent. So thanks for this. So uh, as I was saying, Anna Cristina, before we start uh, recording this presentation, uh, some of you who may know the work that I'm uh, usually doing, uh, may be a bit surprised by what I'm going to present because it's less fundamental than usual. Actually, the fact is that uh, it's been a few years that I'm involved in uh, coordinating uh, quantum hubs in France, so especially the quantum hub of Grenoble for uh, quantum science and technology. And I have monitored the emergence of uh, quantum technologies and especially quantum computing. And at the same time, I'm working a lot actually in quantum thermodynamics and I noticed that uh, there was no energetic monitoring of quantum technologies while uh, they are, uh, say, heavily deployed uh, with lots of money. And so with a few colleagues, uh, we, we, we took the, the initiative actually to make a diagnosis. Why, why is that so? And the fact is that uh, we think that the reason why currently quantum technologies, they are being developed without really thinking about energy consumption or energetic advantage. It's simply because people, they are not prepared to work together because there is no methodology. And uh, we need to create a research line, actually, an interdisciplinary research line. And that's the whole purpose of this quantum energy initiative that I'm going to, to present you today uh, that uh, contains a manifesto that contains a first paper as a proof of, of concept and uh, contains your signatures and goodwill if, if you want to join. So uh, to go a bit more into the details now, uh, here is the outline of the talk. So I'm going to spend some time to present the general context of uh, the energetics of quantum technologies and what are the motivation of this uh, emerging field. Then I will present, as I was saying, uh, a proof of concept, namely a uh, first set of, of results uh, that was obtained uh, by a former PhD student of mine, uh, where we have applied our methodology to the case of a superconducting quantum computer and uh, shown how we could optimize the energetic efficiency of a scalable quantum computer before uh, jumping on conclusions and outlooks. So first of all, uh, a bit of context and motivation and uh, and the first uh, thing that I want to to say to motivate uh, the, 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 the energetics of quantum technologies is to think a little bit about the concept of efficiency. This is kind of a very schematic view on a human activity. A human activity, you and especially technology, you try to design a machine that uh, you will uh, provide with input, either material or energy, such that it implements a task and you are going to assess the, the performance of the task with a given metric of performance. And uh, actually with this very basic 
a set of, of pictures, you can already understand what an efficiency is. An efficiency, and there is a sign missing here, an efficiency is nothing but uh, the ratio of the metric of performance divided by the resource cost. Okay, very simple. And in that view, the purpose of science and technology, you can say that it's increasing efficiencies. And this is, for instance, the big message of, of thermodynamics, the old, the grandpa thermodynamics that we learn uh, when, we, when we basically start physics. Okay? And so, uh, when you say that in a conference with uh, people who know a little bit history and, and care about the evolution of technologies, they would tell you that it's not always good to, to improve efficiencies because there is what is known as the rebound effect or the Jevons paradox. So Jevons was a guy who was living during the, the first industrial revolution and uh, he actually noticed uh, with the example of the coal burning factories that if you had an increase of efficiency, actually it does not necessarily lead to a reduction of the global resource consumption. On, on the opposite, it actually increases the global resource consumption. And so it seems, looking at this paradox, that increasing efficiencies could actually lead to negative environmental consequences. And so, actually, uh, the solution of the paradox is simply to put everything at its own, at its right place. Uh, when you talk about efficiency and resource consumption, you are in physics. This is objective. But here, everything that is written in blue, it is economy. So where does the Jevons paradox come from? If you increase the efficiency of the process, then you decrease the resource cost. And obviously, therefore, you decrease the price of the product. And therefore, you increase the demand. And so, therefore, you increase the global resource consumption. But it's not because of physics. Again, it's because of market law and economy. So the negative environmental consequences, they may be there, but it's not a fatality. And it's certainly not physics that should be to blame here. OK, so I want to bring back the debate, the debate where it should be. Increasing efficiency from our point of view is good because it leads to a decrease of a resource cost. And this can lead to the Jevons paradox if you don't pay attention. But if you are uh, if you care about the use cases, for instance, it leads to another very nice consequence, which is that you can reach the same performance with less resource. And this, in my opinion, is a very reasonable paradigm shift in uh, our finite physical world. OK, so that will be actually my, my motto in, in, in this colloquium. I will feel like increasing efficiency and I will try to provide ourselves with the proper tool to increase efficiencies. So before I, I, I go to quantum technologies and especially quantum computing, I want to make a detour through uh, classical computing. Uh, where actually people, it's been a while, they think about energy efficiency and they try to improve it. So this is a scheme of a classical computer. The power consumption is the resource cost, usually, and the performance uh, is usually thought at as uh, or measured as a number of floating point operations per second. Uh, it's FLOPS, the acronym. And this is basically the, the computing power. And the, the faster you compute, the better it is, the more series you can watch on Netflix and stuff. So that's what we want, uh, at least in, uh, in the world of before. And with these two quantities, you can build what is called the performance per watt, which is measured in flops per watt. And this performance per watt, if you look at the general evolution of computer over years, it has increased. It has increased, it, uh, and, and this increase is, uh, is basically captured by what is called Kumi's law. And Kumi's law tells you, so it's the equivalent of, um, of um, ah, sorry, I'm missing the word now. Never mind, I will come back to this later maybe. So this Kumi's law, is, ah yeah, Moore's law. So it's the, it's the counterpart of Moore's law, but uh, energy wise. Kumi's law, it tells you that uh, the energy efficiency of classical computing, it has doubled every 18 months since the birth of computers. And unfortunately, for some reasons, it saturates 
since 2010. So, uh, but the state of the art still uh, nowadays, it's 40 gigaflops per watt uh, that is reached for one of these supercomputers, uh, well, where they are regularly uh, ranked. Okay. So now the problem is that uh, we have again the Jevons paradox. So because of this increase of efficiency of the classical computers, then more and more people wanted to use computers. And therefore we had a, a, a explosion of the global electricity consumption because of ICT, which means information and communication technologies, which is more than 10% uh, nowadays. And so uh, the problem is amplified by the fact that, as I was saying, there is no expected gain, gain in efficiency due to the end of Comey's law. And uh, this increase uh, um, of consumption uh, regarding ICT, it also affects the raw material consumption and the product life cycle, uh, life cycle. So it has a huge environmental cost. So we need a paradigm shift. And uh, lately, there are some alternative uh, technologies that have started to be considered very seriously by uh, the industry and by uh, private companies and governments all over the world, uh, which are these uh, quantum technologies that hold the promise to store, process and transfer information more efficiently. So we we'll have to define what it is more efficiently than their classical counterparts. So what does it mean? Uh, more efficiently. So here uh, I'm going to focus on quantum computing, but keep in mind that there are other quantum technologies which uh, are quantum communication, quantum metrology, quantum sensing, etc. But all along this talk, I'm going to tell you about uh, quantum computing. So what is the promise of quantum computing? Um, it can be expressed by this very schematic uh, plot where you have a given problem uh, with a given size. I don't really precise what it means that uh, you want to solve and this requires a certain amount of computing time okay this is uh, the explosion of the computing time if you use a classical computer there are some classes of problem where this uh, time computing time increases exponentially until reaching times that are not reasonable in practice so there is some flexibility here to define what is not reasonable. The age of the universe, in our opinion, is, is not reasonable. So you can say that above this point, this problem will never be solved. And now the promise of quantum computing is that uh, thanks to quantum logic, you can expect gain in complexity that will make problems that were usually exponentially complex, uh, bring them back to less exponentially complex. And so Doing so, actually, you bring back problems that were not practically solvable into problems that can be solved. And this is captured by this concept of performance, which here is maybe the computing power, which is the problem size divided by the time. And you see that using the quantum, the promise of the quantum is to increase the performance of, uh, is, is to increase this computing power. With this very basic scheme, you can also define two, uh, two uh, regimes. The regime that has been dubbed quantum computational supremacy, when a quantum computer can do what no classical computer could in a reasonable time. And you also have uh, a vision of what is a quantum computational advantage, where simply a quantum computer computes faster than a classical one. Okay? So now, uh, this is the ideal world. This is typically what was, bo what was born in the brain of uh, fantastically smart people like uh, uh, David Dutch and, and others in the 90s. But uh, since then, uh, we have realized that actually, uh, so quantum computing undergoes noise. So perturbations, decoherence. I mean, basically to do a quantum computation, you would need to perfectly isolate your quantum process processor. And since you are not able to isolate it perfectly, um, then you get what is called noise. Yeah, that is symbolized here by these dyes. And this noise, uh, the problem is that you need to cure it to do your calculation. And because of the fact that you have to cure it, it increases the number of physical states uh, steps you need 
physical operations you need to complete your calculation. And since it increases the number of, of physical steps, then you can maybe reach regimes where actually the quantum advantage is not that obvious anymore. Moreover, you can also deal with very smart classical people who are able to optimize your computing algorithms in a way that it also seriously reduces the number of steps that you use to execute your computation with classical tools. So all this is actually a big motivation of the current community of quantum computing, which is, well, to understand if quantum supremacy and advantage, they are noise resilient and at which condition. And it also allows us to identify new regimes, uh, the regime where you need error correction to do your calculation, uh, which is here after some typical size of your problem. And then you can distinguish between small size of large or large scale error correction. And you also have what is called NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, computers, where you play, you try to identify if there may be some quantum advantage with small quantum processors, like 50 qubits in instead of 50 millions, you see? So, and, and for these new regimes, we try to define use cases. So it is really a, a big work currently uh, to, 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 to answer or to address these, uh, these questions. And now, the question uh, that, I brought, that I want to bring here uh, is, uh, can, we, uh, can we have regimes where actually this is energy that matters? So can we bring the debate, can we bring the reflection on the energetic uh, playground? And actually, we can re-express the problem using very similar uh, mindset. So uh, using this notion of efficiency I have introduced before, where actually our performance is the problem size and the resource cost would be the energy I need to execute the calculation and to solve a problem of that size. Okay, so I can draw the same kind of plot here with the problem size uh, on the X axis and the energy consumption on the Y axis and revisit what I see. Okay, and then I can define what would be a quantum energy advantage. A quantum energy advantage, it's when a quantum computer solves a problem with less energy than best in class classical computers and algorithms. And the quantum energy supremacy, it's when a quantum computer solves a problem that no classical computer could solve with reasonable amount of energy, being a nuclear plant, for instance. You can pick like this, uh, you can pick this kind of limit. You see? And then you can also have another uh, criterion, which is you have a quantum energy advantage when uh, you can solve larger problems with a quantum computer than with a classical computer with, a with the same energy. OK, so this precise a little bit the type of concepts we can use and what is efficiency good for. So now the whole problem is to properly define the efficiency of a quantum computer. And this is extremely complicated. And that's where actually there is lots of work to do. This is complicated. Why? Because this is an interdisciplinary challenge. Why is that so? Because as I said, an efficiency, it's a ratio. In the ratio, there is a numerator and a denominator. At the numerator, what you put is a metric of performance. Okay? And in the case of quantum computing, the metric of performance, it's defined at the quantum level of the processor, where the processor is modeled as a quantum open system. And basically, the metric of performance that you will extract from your computation it depends on the level of control that you have been able to acquire over noise, okay? Better control, well, uh, large metric of performance because there are few errors. Smaller control, there are many errors and a small metric of performance. So you see all this, it's actually the realm of quantum open system, quantum control, quantum thermodynamics to manage these kind of questions. But then, there is the question of the resource. And here comes the interdisciplinarity. To define my efficiency, 
I need to involve resources that are usually macroscopic. These are the resources that are used to uh, implement some classical control on my processor. These are the resources that I use to isolate my processor, to put my Schrodinger cat state in a box, if you like. Okay? And because of this, uh, my processor still needs to communicate with the external world. So it's never perfectly isolated. So actually, all this uh, put together means that um, optimizing resource consumption requires to optimize non-trivial sweet spots that are defined by macroscopic and quantum inputs. So we really need to foster a cross-disciplinary research industry collaboration that couples the quantum level, where the, perf uh, the performance is decided, and the macroscopic one, where the resource consumption is uh, defined. And that's, again, the purpose of the Quantum Energy Initiative. So, uh, just to summarize, uh, at the macroscopic level, the typical kind of resources you are, you are going to find, they are the resources that are provided by what we call in the jargon enabling technologies. So everything that is here that uh, allows you to build the context uh, within which you are going to put your quantum processor. And for this, well, you, can, you may need cryogeny, you may need good wires to bring your controlling signal uh, into your cryostat. You need control electronics, computers, classical computers. You need microwave, lasers, amplifiers, detectors. All these guys, they eat a lot of energy. And then at the quantum level, once again, uh, you have the quantum processor that you try to control over noise, which defines the metric. And optimizing all this is the realm of fundamental research, quantum information science, quantum software fabricating good qubits, uh, managing and modeling quantum open systems, performing proper quantum control, and uh, obviously quantum thermodynamics that teaches us the management of resources at the quantum scale. Okay, so the typical questions that uh, we can explore uh, owing to this uh, interdisciplinary research line that we want to, con con to build, uh, they are the following. We can ask ourselves the question, is there a quantum energy advantage as the processors scale up? So typically the kind of schemes I have drawn uh, at the beginning of this talk. And how different is quantum energy advantage from the quantum computational advantage that everyone is running after? What is, and that's a very fundamental question I like a lot because uh, in the bones I'm someone who likes fundamental physics, uh, what is the fundamental minimal energy cost of quantum computing, taking into account the classical context around? In other words, what is the minimal cost of putting a Schrodinger cat state in a box? What are the scaling laws of the quantum energy efficiency? And on a more practical point of view, uh, we can use this uh, Quantum Energy Initiative to propose and make accept energy-based benchmarks and create optimization tools for the people who are building the quantum processors. And all this with the goal to avoid energetic dead ends on the road of large-scale computers, just like the one that we are currently observing for the supercalculators, for the supercomputers that uh, consume a lot of energy. Um, and obviously, as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, uh, the interest of this methodology, which is actually extremely versatile, general, flexible, etc., because I started by an overview on human activities, if you remember, the idea is to extend this to other quantum-based technologies like quantum communication, sensing, metrology, also quantum neural networks can be uh, uh, an interesting playground for these kind of ideas. Okay, so that's for the very, very general context. And now I'm going to uh, show you how we can apply, uh, well, what is the methodology that we suggest to apply and uh, what are the results if we apply the methodology onto, um, I would say, a futuristic 
uh, model of a superconducting quantum computer. So uh, our goal here is to show that we can optimize the energetic efficiency of scalable quantum computers. And by scalable, uh, here I, I'm going to, to, to apply it really because I'm going to, to consider uh, computations of increasing complexity. First, the simplest component you can think about, which is a single qubit gate. Then I will go to a noisy quantum circuit. And then eventually I will consider the case of fault tolerant large scale quantum computer. So, and uh, these results I'm going to show you, they are presented in this paper, which is actually the first seed of the quantum energy initiative, and which is actually a, a close French Singaporean collaboration. And uh, well, I like this peak because uh, before I was on, I was in Grenoble and, and now I've joined my, my colleague in Singapore. So, um, okay, so what is this methodology? Uh, in our jargon, we have adopted the metric noise resource methodology or MNR. So it's not NMR, it's MNR. And um, it's like um, how to apply the recipe. So the first thing that you want to do, if you want to define and optimize an energetic efficiency, is to define your control parameters. What are the parameters that, as an experimentalist, you will be able to tune to optimize uh, your energy consumption, for instance? So this, we call them CI, that can be a temperature, that can be a number of qubits, that can be, um, that can be what else? You will see examples later, but that can be an attenuator in a microwave wa waveguide, these kind of things. These are classical parameters, the one that you that you use to, to control your quantum system. Then you need to define a metric of performance. And here as well, there is some flexibility. You may be interested in metrics at the quantum level, like the fidelity of, of a gate or a quantum computation, but you can also be interested in like what we call end user metrics, like simply the size of the problem that your co quantum computer is able to solve. That is a good metric of performance for someone who doesn't know shit about uh, what is inside uh, the black box that computes. Okay, so you can play with both kinds of metrics. Then once you have done this, you uh, will model the processor dynamics. So for those who uh, know a little bit about quantum open system, uh, the basic way to model a quantum open system di dynamics, it's called the Lindblad equation you see uh, here written. And this Lindblad equation will depend obviously on the noise that is present uh, on your on your quantum uh, processor, but also on the classical parameters you have uh, put uh, that you have set to control uh, your your uh, processor. And thanks to this equation, if you integrate this equation uh, over the time of the computation, you are able to model or to get an expression for your metric of performance, uh, M of the uh, control parameters. And finally, in the same way, you uh, should give you the, the, the means to model the resource cost that also depend on your classical parameters, which are your buttons. They are the degrees of freedom, the stuff you have access to to control your system. So it also corresponds to a resource cost. So this resource cost, I'm going to tell you about power and energy, but actually a resource is much more general and you can use exactly the same methodology to optimize uh, a time, to optimize uh, money that you spend, to optimize whatever. It's really uh, very general. Once you have done this, the whole trick is to say, okay, now I want to reach this target metric. So say it's M no. I want to be able to reach M no. This gives me an implicit relation on my control parameters. And then the whole idea is to minimize the resource cost, R of CI, under this constraint on the CI parameters. So it's a minimization under constraint, if you like, seen from a very general viewpoint. 
And this minimization under constraint, it allows you to maximize the resource efficiency of your quantum task, which is here defined as the metric of performance M0 divided by the minimal resource cost R mine of M0. Okay, so that's really the, the general guidelines we have applied and we uh, pretend it would be worth applying to many, many devices and, and situations uh, that you encounter uh, when you work in quantum technologies. So let us apply it first to the case of a single qubit gate. So, and, and here we are back to fundamental quantum optics. Um, so single qubit gate, it's, it's schematized here. You have a qubit here that you uh, drive with a light pulse that is resonant or quasi-resonant. And actually with this kind of light matter interaction, you can implement any single qubit gate because you are going to play with the detuning between the pulse and the qubit, or you can play on the phase of the pulse. And so with this, you can implement um, all the primitive gates that you need to, to do a, a, a computation. So that's our quantum task. And then what is the resource? So if we want to define properly the resource, actually we need the colleagues uh, of quantum thermodynamics, but here it's, I would say, a proof of concept. So we are going to use a very, very basic definition of the resource. We're going to say it's the typical energy or the typical power of the pulse. I'm not trying to define heat work or whatever in this situation. I'm just going to say, mm, this is defined by the number of photons I send, and I don't go further in the fundamental questioning. Now, what is the noise? The noise, it's actually, so for those who know a bit of quantum optics, it's actually due to the fact that if you send too little energy here, too few photons, then these few photons are going to get entangled with your qubit. And because of this light matter entanglement, you are not uh, going to uh, perform a perfect gate. So there is a trade-off between fidelity and energy that was already singled out by uh, Gibbon et Cloche, uh, uh, yeah, 20 years ago, recognized by uh, uh, Miko Motonen uh, more recently. And this is on this trade-off that we are going to play here. So um, just to mention, uh, this is typically with this kind of gates that uh, I've played uh, to explore fundamental problems of quantum thermodynamics with uh, experimenters' friends, uh, one in Lyon, in the group of Benjamin Huard. We have uh, performed a, a study of the energetics of a single qubit gate. Um, and uh, with uh, my friend Pascal Senelard uh, at C2N Paris, where we have uh, played uh, and explored uh, rather how quantum coherence uh, can uh, act or influences work exchanges between a qubit and a pulse of light. So just to tell you this scenery that we use it here just like a starting point for our methodology, we can also play a very fundamental and nice game uh, with it. Uh, it's a beautiful scenery at the interface between quantum optics and quantum thermodynamics. Okay, so now coming back to our problem of uh, energy efficiency optimization, um, I told you uh, now our problem is to have a description of the dynamics of uh, our quantum gate. And the dynamics, again, for those who know quantum optics here, it's, it's very plain and simple. It's uh, the usual optical block equations with a lean bladian here that uh, captures spontaneous emission with a rate gamma and uh, a Hamiltonian that captures the quasi resonant drive with a Rabi frequency uh, big omega. And ideal gate is implemented when, uh, well, when we can neglect spontaneous emission in waveguide, basically. So when omega is much bigger than gamma. And if we have this, um, then we can add uh, an ingredient. It's that we are playing here with, uh, with something that I call one-dimensional atom. And with a one-dimensional atom, actually, there is a, a relation between the big omega, which is the Rabi frequency or the, the strength of the driving, and the gamma, which is the coupling with the, with the vacuum of the waveguide. 
and uh, it is this constraint basically which gives you an analytic expression for the power of the pulse that I need to implement a gate. Okay, so this will be my resource basically. That will be my resource cost. That's the power that I need to invert the qubit population. And at the same time, uh, so like I said, it's M and R. So I have R because I have the resource cost. I have N because I have the noise. That's the spontaneous emission noise. And now I need the M. Uh, what is the metric of performance? And the metric of performance is the fidelity. And the gate fidelity, by applying this very simple formalism, or, or working out this simple formalism of quantum optics, you can find that it's one minus uh, gamma tau, where uh, gamma is the number of stochastic events, basically, and tau is the duration of the gate. So typically, this is the number of errors that you can uh, let uh, that will take place while you operate the gate. So we can also uh, dub this parameter gamma tau, it's R, it's the probability of error during the gate. So here we can choose as a control parameter the gate duration, which is tau. And uh, if uh, we do this, then if we set our uh, target uh, me uh, performance metric at M0, then it sets tau zero, the duration of the gate, to this value here. And then you can easily get the bare gate efficiency. And the bare gate efficiency, well, it's the metric divided by the resource cost to reach this metric. And as you can see, it has a very simple expression as a function of the metric, of the target metric itself. OK, so uh, there are two comments we can make on this bare gate efficiency, bare meaning that so far we are just playing with fundamental quantum resources. Um, the first one is that uh, at the denominator of this efficiency, you find gamma h bar omega, which are quantities that characterize the qubit I'm playing with. And uh, the so the smaller h bar omega or the smaller the spontaneous emission rate, the bigger the efficiency of the gate. And this kind of makes sense, right? If there are less, if there is less spontaneous emission, then the efficiency is better because spontaneous emission is bad to implement good gates. So it, it's kind of intuitive. And actually this can lead to a benchmarking between different qubit technologies. And then the other thing that you can notice is that this quantity here, this M01 minus M0 to the square, it gets lower and lower when my target uh, performance uh, gets nearer one. Which means, uh, very deep message actually, the larger the metric you target, the smaller the efficiency, meaning uh, it costs more and more when you want to increase your metric by one digit, more and more. And uh, well, that's a feature that we have actually found all over the place in the different situations we went through. Uh, so it's nice to keep this in mind. And now I, I've told you about the, the bare uh, gate efficiency. Uh, and the whole problem is to, to dress the gate, to reach uh, an estimation of the resource cost uh, that is actually nearer what the experimenters they are going to measure in the lab. So this is our bare single qubit gate, where, as I was saying, the only resource cost we have considered is this uh, pulse power, basically, at the quantum level. But now what we have to realize is that uh, this gate is not alone in space like uh, the, the, the spherical co in the vacuum, right? There is something around. Um, firstly, uh, the qubit is at low temperature. And uh, to reach this low temperature, it, uh, we, we have had to isolate it from the external world where there is a temperature different, much higher. 
And so this has a cost because this is clearly uh, what thermodynamics calls a non-equilibrium situation. And when you have a non-equilibrium physical situation, then you have to pay usually. Uh, going against equilibrium has a cost. Second thing, uh, you want to talk to your gate here. So you cannot maintain it isolated like this. You need to dig holes in your uh, box to bring your controlling signal down to the gate, or down to the qubit. And if you dig a hole, then you bring some noise from the external world inside your box. So uh, again, this is another kind of non-equilibrium situation that you have here, which will generate other costs. So the solution that people of superconducting circuits have found to uh, mitigate the noise that comes from the external world is to uh, um, prepare very, very energetic signals here and to attenuate them while they enter the cryostat, such that the noise that comes with them, it gets attenuated other, uh, as well. And, uh, and we keep the same signal to noise ratio, but we have small noise here and a reasonable amount of signal. It basically divides both the signal and the noise by uh, an amount A, okay? But this has a cost as well, because if you attenuate the signal like this, then it means that there is a lot of energy that is dissipated inside. And this energy dissipation, well, it corresponds to a heat rate, and this heat rate, you have to bring it out. And this actually defines the biggest resource cost. The fact that, so it's what we call the cryogenic cost, and the fact that all this heat that is dissipated by uh, your attenuator here, you have to extract it and put it back at, uh, in the external world at room temperature. And here, it's just a matter of applying like uh, really stupid, basic, classical thermodynamics that tells you that the cryo power you have to spend, it's this ratio, the external temperature divided by the qubit temperature, multiplied by the amount of heat you have to evacuate, which is A minus one, the power of the pulse. And you see in red here, this is a magnification factor. And this is a magnification factor of the fundamental costs that you have at the level of your processor. And this is a very important message. It means that everything that people do in quantum thermodynamics by uh, learning how to uh, manage resources properly at the quantum level, you will find them back at the macroscopic level because there is some amplification going on. Okay. In other words, it's worth saving small energy at the small level at the microscopy level, because it will be reflected at the macroscopic one. Okay, so once we have understood this, we can apply MNR on our dressed single qubit gate. And uh, MNR means metric noise resource. So what is the metric? Well, the metric will still be the gate fidelity, still at the quantum level. The noise, it's the thermal noise. So it's not only spontaneous emission, but it's also at finite temperature, there is also a bit of absorption of thermal photons. And the resource, this is our cryo power. And this cryo power, as we saw, this is a macroscopic resource because there is a magnification factor. And what are our control parameters? Our control parameters, there are the attenuation on the way uh, on the way to the gate from the external world inside the cryostat. And uh, there is the qubit temperature. These are the two parameters we have chosen to optimize um, to get a minimal resource cost. And this is typically the kind of results that we had. So um, this is a 2D plot where you have the attenuation on the X axis and the temperature on the Y axis. And the Z axis corresponds to the power consumption that is uh, written in Watt. And these uh, white lines that you see here, they correspond to ISO M. So these are the lines that correspond to a well-defined metric of performance. OK, so uh, there are a few comments that we can do on this plot. 
The first one is uh, the larger the metric of performance, the larger the cost. This is typically what you see here. If I want to uh, increase, well, it's not really the metric of performance that we have here, it's the error. So if we want to increase, uh, to decrease the error, we have to increase the power consumption to go towards larger and larger powers, which, well, is really intuitive. If you want to be more performance, then you are going to have a bigger resource cost. So there is nothing very surprising here. It's just that now we have a quantitative, uh, a quantitative um, vision of it. And the other comments that I can do is that when you target a given metric of performance, so say this one, uh, 5, uh, 10 to the minus 4, then uh, you can choose to either set a maximum temperature for your qubit or a minimum attenuation. And, uh, and you can wander along this ISO M and choose the parameters, the set of parameters that you perfect, knowing that at some point here you reach a minimum, which corresponds exactly what we want to do, which is the minimization of the resource cost, which here is the cryo power. Okay? And doing so, we can play the game of the efficiency as well. So we have plotted the, the efficiency that we had. So here it's in watt minus one. Uh, the efficiency that we have uh, from this plot as a function of the target uh, metric of performance that, uh, you, that you sweep by going along this green line here. And what you see is typically the behavior I was telling you before the bigger the target, the smaller the efficiency, meaning to gain a point of uh, fidelity here, you need to put more and more on the table. Okay, And this is the, uh, the same uh, kind of study, but here we have put the optimized temperature. Okay, uh, now I come to some open questions for this uh, at the level of this gate. And uh, since it's been one hour I'm talking and I still have a lot of things to say, I think it doesn't make any sense. I, I keep on discussing and going to the large scale. I don't know what the chairman is, is thinking about this, but I think I may, I, I may rather jump to conclusions and I will be happy to answer a bit of questions, but uh, I'm afraid this is too much otherwise, especially for those who don't uh, I mean, swim into quantum computing all the time. So I, I'm going to conclude on this single qubit gate part and then jump on general conclusions. So what are the open questions, at least at this fundamental level? And what is the link with quantum thermodynamics? The first thing we could explore, which would be a very nice uh, PhD thesis or, or, or topic for postdoc, by the way, is uh, can we apply this MNR methodology on other types of single qubit gates. And there is a zoo of possible single qubit gates. Here I took a resonant one, but we could play with adiabatic, non-resonant, also photonic uh, qubit gates, where you just have a gate by sending photons on a beam splitter. You see, it's absolutely not the same physics or the same situation. And still we should define a resource cost, a metric of performance and a noise and see how, uh, sorry, and see how they, they, uh, how they are coupled. Also, I only told you about thermal noise, but actually uh, for those who are a little bit in the business, thermal noise is the last noise you care about when you are inside the cryostat. Actually, you have already paid a lot to be at low temperature and there are many other types of noise that bother you. Uh, pure dephasing, phase flip, beat flip, uh, well, many other types of noise than the thermal one. So we should be able to establish model and revisit everything that I've shown you now uh, with like relevant types of noise instead of the thermal one. And also, uh, that's what I briefly mentioned before. Uh, what about other resource costs? Because here I was really brute force. I said, OK, my resource cost is going to be the energy in the pulse. But you could also argue that once you've done the gate, well, you could, for instance, reverse the gate and get back the energy that you have put in. So that would be an example of reversible computing on a single component. You could also think, 
Well, but not everything is absorbed in my pulse. So how about I just count what has been absorbed by the qubit and I don't count the difference? You see? And all these discussions, they are legitimate and they should be considered to see what really matters at the macroscopic uh, level. And that's really in this uh, sp space of discussion, I would say, that the debate about what is work and what is heat really matters. Now, uh, about MNR. So, um, at the level of, of, at this fundamental level, actually what MNR does, basically, is the search for a minimal resource cost to reach a given metric of performance against noise. If you think about it, this is nothing but a fundamental bound, but in the quantum realm. So somehow, at this fundamental level, we, uh, we are back to quantum thermodynamics. Uh, but the nice thing with MNR is that a language that we can also apply at other levels of description. But if we stick to quantum resources, quantum noise, and a quantum metric of performance, then we get back to quantum thermodynamics. And obviously, knowing that, you can ask the relation with entropy production, uh, how does this MNR methodology relate to um, irreversibility? And how would, that's what I was mentioning above, how would reversible computing like reduce possibly the cost of the computation? And finally, these dress costs that I have told you about, they involve the cost of classical control. And I would say a really super exciting uh, fundamental problem would be to search if these dress costs, they are always system dependent. I was already specific in what I have presented you because I told you about the cryogenic cost, I told you about wires and I did not tell you about the conduction but this is also something we can put in the game the conduction of the wires and make optimizations on that but you can ask could we define a minimal energy cost that would involve this cost of classical control and could this be system independent is there a fundamental bound basically to put a Schrodinger cat state in a box and that's really something that uh, is a nice way of reformulating like uh, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics using energetic uh, uh, figures of merit. So um, actually th this could already be a, a nice conclusion. Um, let me stop the, the presentation and see if there is something else I want to say, but I'm afraid this brings you brings us way too far and um, is there a chairman who wants to interact with me for a moment and tell me what I should do? Sorry, uh, it's uh, as you as you want. Like, uh, if you want to talk a bit more, it's fine. Like, uh, but it's it's up to you, actually. I, I think um, because I'm I'm afraid. I mean, as far as the audience is concerned, I'm talking to undergraduate students, right? Uh, graduate students and yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I think I'm going to, just to give you the big conclusions. And uh, again, if someone is interested, I can also interact by email or, or stuff, but also for me, it's starting to be late. Uh, and I, I took my time to present the basic notions and I, I, I'm happy if people have already captured uh, stuff that I've said up to now. So I'm going to jump to the big, uh, take home messages now. So, okay, perfect. Yeah. So the big take home messages is that um, if we extend actually, uh, so so far I told you about uh, energy optimization for a gate, a single qubit gate. Now you can go down that road and uh, investigate what's happening for circuits and for uh, computations that uh, potentially involve error correction. And what we have seen um, with my uh, with my team and my former PhD students is that um, we can single out some conditions, but using really futuristic qubits, excellent qubits, excellent quality, which don't exist yet, 
we can see that uh, there may be a quantum energy advantage, which can be a huge practical interest for quantum computing, which is usually not put forward because, as I was saying before, um, people they rather tend to run after the computing power rather than uh, the energy efficiency. And what we say here is that running after the energy efficiency is also a very like um, interesting figure of merit uh, to optimize its a respectable goal. And this is the one that we are trying to put forward because it involves the same kind of uh, energy, uh, uh, fundamental research and industry uh, bound creation. So it's different from the quantum computational advantage and it should be explored and optimized now because it, it requires, uh, it mandates specific optimizations. And this is only an interdisciplinary research line that can do this optimization, which is the one that is called by the QEI. Uh, we propose a new benchmark, which is this quantum energy efficiency, that is the uh, metric of performance divided by the resource cost that I have played with on the simple example of a single qubit gate. And uh, if you bring this energy efficiency and optimize it at the level of circuits and fault tolerant quantum computation, what you realize is that it's a tool to optimize both the software and the hardware, both the fundamental stage and the full stack. And ultimately, it could lead to a ranking between uh, quantum computers that is equivalent to uh, a ranking between supercomputers that exists now, which is called the, the green 500 that uh, actually ranks the most energy efficient supercomputers. So we could play that game for uh, quantum computers. And uh, the performance, the, the, per the perspective, sorry, um, it's to benchmark different qubit technologies. So you had an example on the single qubit gates. There was already a, a hint that uh, the energy efficiency could be used to compare qubit technologies. And right now on the market, you have superconducting qubits. You have also photons, ions, silicon spin qubits, Rydberg atoms, uh, and, and more that I forget. You can use this uh, energy efficiency to, com uh, to compare various computing paradigm, uh, analog, analog sorry, versus gate-based, fault tolerant versus NISC, you can also compare various quantum technology, uh, use this uh, efficiency for different quantum technologies, not only computing, but communication and sensing. And it brings like engineering, methodologic and fundamental, uh, very nice challenges. So this is a picture of uh, the team that I left <laughs> uh, since I've been to Singapore and uh, that, well, some of them are going to visit, but uh, actually the nice thing is that now we really operate as a, a non-local team uh, with a node in France and a node in Singapore. And, um, and these are the experimentalists I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to work with. Uh, some of them, or I would say even most of them, we are not in the business of quantum thermodynamics uh, before, and now they are kind of happy to play with these concepts, and I'm happy to have brought them here, because again, uh, fundamentally speaking, it's thrilling, and it may have very nice uh, applications. So here are a few of the a few papers we've had together. Um, industry is also very interested, um, and and Oddly enough, when I talk about the QEI, uh, very often the industrial answer first, they are much more reactive than uh, academics uh, in that matter. And uh, so this is the website where you can find uh, what, uh, what we, I was about to say fight for, but it's a little bit too big. Um, what, uh, what we are argue for, basically. Uh, so it's this effort to foster cross-disciplinary research industry community. So this is the, the address, sorry, uh, this is the address of the website, quantumenergyinitiative.org. There is a manifesto which is here 
to show that we have a critical mass and also to, to connect people and at some point we'll start organizing events together. So it's really a bottom-up initiative. Uh, we have a poll as well, which is a first, st a first step to foster an uh, international network. These are the co-founders uh, of, the, of the initiative. So uh, Olivier Ezrati, who is a consultant and author, Robert Whitney, uh, I work with, uh, who is based in Grenoble and with whom I have this uh, non-local uh, team, and Janine uh, Spetsdorser, who is based in, in Sweden. Uh, Sweden was also very um, reactive to this initiative. Lots of signature very fast. And that's it. And uh, so I, I, I thank you for I guess you were for your attention, I guess, because I don't see you, but <laughs> that's that's the the sadness of this kind of uh, of talks. Um, how should I stop sharing my screen? Um, Maybe this. Yeah, that's it. So, Alexia, thank you very much for the, this very, very nice talk. Um, I must confess to you that um, Usually I heard about uh, quantum computing and ways of like um, increase the performance and everything. But then this discussion about the energy efficiency and uh, the costs, I think this is something very um, important to the de development of the field. And I really like uh, everything you, you, you mentioned and all the, the, the work you, you're doing now and especially this quantum initiative, so it's very nice. I will read a bit more about about later and then maybe we can talk again and this is really cool. Yeah, amazing. sure. And uh, you, you are welcome to ask us question and uh, and obviously to sign up. Uh. <laughs> 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 Hello, here. <yeah. laughs> um, so sure, now we... It's already, but they are my Brazilian friends, so almost it doesn't count, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so I think now we can open uh, for questions. So if uh, someone has one qu has questions, please uh, be free to ask Alexia. Ah, so uh, Renato, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah perfectly. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk, Alexia, um, and congrats for this very nice initiative. Well, I, I had maybe a very silly question. I, I was wondering, we uh, we could not focus on entropy instead of energy. I mean, why not defining, uh, I don't know, some notion of efficiency with basis on entropy, you see, I mean, maybe maybe the idea is, can we consider that information is something most fundamental? Uh, information is more fundamental than energy and then try to make some notion of efficiency with basis on entropy? I, I uh, That's a very good question and actually, uh, that's what I, I, I try to uh, impulse when I said this MNR methodology is actually much more general than uh, simply uh, uh, energetic balances. You can pick up any kind of resource uh, and, and then it's a matter of deciding regarding entropy if it is a resource or a noise. I think it's both, right? Mm -hmm. Because usually entropy is here to, 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 to quantify noise. And at the same time, uh, you're going to use information to evacuate entropy. And information is also quantified by, by entropy. So uh, yes, definitely. And, and I fully subscribe to the idea that um, this initiative, uh, it can also structure a fundamental effort. Uh, and actually, to be honest, that's where I want to go. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm just I'm just preparing a niche here. Um, it, it's important to 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 show and to to make very clear to people that uh, what we do at the fundamental level it has big impact at the macroscopic level. So that's basically what this whole methodology is here for. And I insisted a lot on the fact that costs they get amplified, etc. But indeed. 
at the fundamental level, there are super nice problems to investigate. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Renato, for the question. So, anyone else? Um, yeah, so, oh, oh Mariana, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I it's probably stupid, but I don't remember right now. I know that work is not, um, uh, not very well defined, I wouldn't say that. There is divergence in the definition of work in quantum mechanics. And I was wondering if energy has this problem as well, or it is better defined. So that's an excellent question as well. And to be honest, this is this is the reason why I haven't used the work the word work. Uh, and this is also the reason why uh, we have proposed this MNR methodology. So now I'm going to elaborate a little bit. When I entered in the field of, of quantum thermodynamics, indeed there was this big fight: uh, what is work? What is heat at the quantum level? what is the best way to define them. And this is a big problem because, so after a few years, I think that's because there are not an, enough words, <laughs> first of all. Uh, and I think it also reflects some, some current debates in quantum foundations, because there is the position of the measurement postulate that is basically, I think, at the middle of the debate. Enormous, the elephant in the room, okay? And so, at the same time, there are these quantum technologies that are emerging, and we cannot afford to wait that we in quantum thermodynamics, we agree on what is work to start working on the energetic footprint of quantum technologies. So somehow, what we propose is to take a bit of shortcuts that can also nicely, uh, that have also nicely impact the, the fundamental level, because the more experiments you bring, uh, the more significant and relevant your definitions become. You see? So that's the strategy here. But that was a very good question, and thanks for having me, giving me the opportunity to, to, to say this. Um, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. Um, Alexa, can you still hear me? Now oh, you're kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah. No problem. So your picture is uh, it's just fro your your camera froze a bit, but um, good that you're here. Frozen on a grim. <laughs> <laughs> so more questions. Um, yeah, I also have one question. I can do it now. So I, I, in the one moment, moment you mentioned some work you have done uh, lately, uh, uh, recently, where you're considering the quantum coherence, how it influences work exchanges. Can you elaborate a bit more? Like uh, it's kind of like how to control the coherence to use it for computing or uh, what's the, what was your... Oh, no. So here computing is totally out of the game. It's It's... Uh, it's just uh, an horizon, but what we, the kind of problem that we have uh, and still that we are still investigating with uh, with Pascal Sonella and her team is to, so it's one of the biggest fundamental questions of quantum thermodynamics, uh, which is um, the energetic footprint of quantum coherence, basically. And uh, can quantum coherence be a resource to enhance work exchanges, etc.? Mm -hmm. So we we uh, we have discussed a lot, and there is an experiment where we actually um, uh, that would deserve one hour colloquium. So I'm just going to give you bits of it. You see, yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. it also bounces back on the question before because, but you know, work is not. Uh, we have not. We are not done with defining work. Mm -hmm. I agree, we are not done with defining work in a certain class of system, which is a quantum open system. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have actually clean definitions if instead of considering a quantum open system, we consider a bipartite system. 
that is isolated otherwise. So basically, you just have two guys in the universe. So it mm -hmm. can be actually the, the 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 most stupid picture of the universe you have. You just dig a hole inside, and you have one guy, and then all around the you have the other yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. So that's a bipartite system. So mm -hmm. and we studied the energy exchanges between these two quantum systems, and work in this uh, in this very simplified vision of things. This is the amount of energy that is exchanged via an effective unitary interaction between the two the two guys, which is really intuitive. It makes sense. It's this effective unitary. It doesn't convey any entropy because this is a unitary. So it is an amount of energy that is exchanged without entropy exchange. So this this is our work and heat is the rest, which basically is the energy that is trapped within the correlations. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you apply these definitions that we were not the only one to apply, by the way, and there were former papers that date back to, uh, I would say, 2013 or something. So we picked this framework and we have applied it to a very simple bipartite system, which is a qubit coupled to propagating pulses of light. This mm -hmm. is a closed system as well. And with that, we arrive to definitions of work that clearly uh, show that there is an impact of the coherence on the work exchanges. And this is what we have. So in this paper, this is not the theory in this paper, this is the this is the experiment mm -hmm. uh, where we we basically correlate the amount of work that a qubit does on a field uh, to the amount of coherence that the qubit was initially carrying. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of the story. So that's the, the, the charge uh, step and then there is a discharge of the battery in another field that is propagating through a beam splitter. So we have established another framework with the beam splitter and stuff. So conceptually, this this is a that was really super interesting to do that. And there are experiments, so uh -huh. that's cool, really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is really cool. And so going a bit further, like uh, so, you uh, you investigate the coherence and the uh, like, um, but then. Uh, what can you say about uh, also about uh, entanglement or like quantum correlation? So, OK, you're talking only a single system, but we have a bipartite system. Is this uh, entanglement also some kind of resource like or some quantum feature of this work exchange? So uh, that's a good question that we have not explored yet. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's that's a work to do. <laughs> ah, <nice>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool! Yes. <laughs> um. So yeah, really nice. Uh, yeah. At some moment, maybe we can just uh, talk uh, talk uh, more or make a meeting because this is something that interests me. So I work a bit on quantum correlations, and at some moment, like um, I was in. Uh, but I start to, uh, to get interested at how these correlations could be used like to explore in this uh, quantum thermodynamics domain. So okay. this is mm -hmm. something really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so do you have more questions? Okay, so uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank you, Alexa, for your very, very nice talk. Thank um, you very much. It was a pleasure to have you here with us. And yeah, please feel free to contact us at any moment. And yeah, thank you. And good Likewise. evening. For you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Alexa. And have a good thank night. <laughs>